Hi, hello. Uh, I'm happy to be here again. Uh, I'm here nearly every year. Um, so I'm always excited to be in this beautiful city. Uh, it's a little bit rainy, but on the other hand, the food is great. Um, I'm here today for you with a topic which you might be confused at. What has the rhythm to do with free-to-play games? That's something I want to teach. Um, who is developing or running a free-to-play game here in this audience? Oh, very nice, very nice, yeah. Um, if, in case if you haven't caught who I am, uh, I'm in this business since uh, an eternity, since 1987 professionally. Uh, I sold my first game in 1983 or 84, hobby time, I made my hobby my job. Um, I founded my own studio um, and had a successful exit with that. Um, I was CEO of a public listed company that's like as high as you can get. Um, so that was the highest point of my career. Now it's all about the money. I'm just joking. Um, it's about the fun. And uh, since 15 years, I'm freelance consulting companies about free, everything free to play. Game design, systematic design, monetization design, uh, life operations, everything you know about my favorite topic, which is online games with free to play attached. Um, I'm also creative director of Stratosphere Games, uh, where I'm babysitting uh, one of my favorite projects. I teamed up with Stratosphere to actually um, launch Homeworld Mobile. Uh, it's in the store since October. Uh, we are pretty happy with the performance of the title, and uh, we recently shipped our latest update. Um, so, you know, we have ship skins in there. Do we monetize these? Not yet, but soon. Um, it looks great. It plays great. If you love science fiction games, you know, uh, you can actually play that. Yes, it's a little bit advertising, but you know, if you're proud of your work, you know, never hesitate to actually show your work to, uh, to other people. Um, so, rhythms. I don't mean music. What I mean is that free-to-play games have regular patterns. And if you learn these patterns, you can actually prevent mistakes. You can do a better job. You can even increase retention and monetization if you know the patterns of your game. Um, the patterns are slightly different with each game, but generally they're identical, right? So the learnings I had with the pattern analysis, the first time I did that was like 10, 12 years ago, still apply today, although the game is completely different. <clears throat> and some of these persistent patterns, you know, I'm going to show you today actually with real data. Um, the funny thing is that rhythms are usually tied to the real life calendar. I'm using RL a lot of times, so if you don't know what that means, I mean real life, like the life outside computer games, right? So like here. Um, let's dive into some of these. Um, there are daily rhythms, right? And that's obvious because people don't play every hour of the day. Well, some of you guys do, I know. I did the same when I was young. I now have sleep, family need food, <laughs> other hobbies. Um, but here's the thing. Most games have this sign pattern. And the sign pattern is usually, you know, the peak of the day and then it goes down and then it rises again. And the, the time of day when that peak is depends on your main audience's location. So depending if the US is your major territory or Europe or Asia, that peak shifts. But generally every weekday actually shows this pattern. And that's fascinating because you know that if a day doesn't have that pattern, something is wrong and you can investigate. Um, so how, how do you use that knowledge in order to you know, support your game? One example is what I call cooldowns. You know, many games have cooldowns, like, hey, you can actually raid that dungeon today and then 24 hours later, you can actually raid it again. Right, you know, it's a kind of friction in the mechanic. The problem with 24 hours is that no one is actually on time after 24 hours. So he's like 10 minutes late, half an hour late. Meaning that every time, every day he plays, the point in time he can play is actually shifting later and later. And at some point he cannot play at that time, so he's missing a day. And when he misses that day, he might quit the game because he's kind of angry that he actually missed the loot of that. Maybe there's even a battle pass tied to it or a chain reward and he's just fed up that why can I play that? So instead of 24-hour cooldowns, use 23-hour cooldowns. Very easy rule. Or use generally resets. So there's one time in the day where you say at that time all the cooldowns, all the daily stuff actually resets. You do that with daily quests already or you should. And the question is 
when do I reset my daily quests? 6 a.m. Polish time, noon in the evening. So when should I reset my daily quests? It's a good question, isn't it? Because most of you say, I don't know, and you just guess. Well, the thing is, your major audience, let's say if it's the US, which has a problem that it has two major time zones, Pacific time and the, you know, and the, the what's the other one? Hmm? I forgot. See, West Coast, East Coast. Okay, let's say okay, minus six, minus nine hours. So when do you reset that? Well, you should reset it two or three hours after the longest in the past is actually in bed. Right? So it's early in your morning, let's say 4 a.m., 3 a.m. That's when you should reset it. That conflicts a little bit with one player type you have in Poland, we have in Germany, which are the shift workers. I don't know if you realize that, but there are many people working in day shifts and night shifts. And they are one of the most loyal free-to-play game players. And when you re reset that stuff in the middle of the shift, it's kind of tricky, but nevertheless, find your time, 3 a.m., 2 a.m., 4 a.m., when you should reset these times. Um, this is the general reminder of what I'm telling you now in the next slides, is that Number one rule, players only pay when they play. It's a very fundamental rule, but many games ignore that. I can give you one game, Candy Crush. Candy Crush, after you used up your three hearts, you have to stop playing to wait to, to reload your hearts. That's very bad monetization design. But Candy Crush is like two decades old. So, you know, you should let your players play as long as they like. And the longer they play, the higher the chances they actually pay, right? So you have to take care that your game runs 24 hours, seven days a week, um, so that everybody can play when they want. Some other daily rhythms, national holidays. On national holidays, usually people play more, with a couple of exceptions. So you have to be aware of all the national holidays in your key countries, in Poland, in Germany, in the US, in the UK, everywhere, because this is when this country will peak. And that's a day when you should not maintain your game. Like, oh, the servers are down because we are playing a patch. No, these calendars are red in, you know, you have like this world calendar on the wall and you mark all important national holidays of all the key countries you have. And you say, these are no go zones for updates or any maintenance stuff. <clears throat> you have to be aware, you, do you know what bridge days are? We call them like that. I have no idea how you call them in, in, in English. So let's say Tuesday is a national holiday. So many people take Monday off to make a long weekend. This is what we call bridge days. So when Tuesday is a holiday, you should treat Monday as a holiday as well. Because many people, you know, take vacation. Um, and when they have a long weekend, they usually play more, right? On average. Um, so you should know your key territories. By default, you should know, right? You know where they downloaded most, where the players are coming from. You should know that as part of the normal KPIs. Um, the, the time zones, of course, their work habits. There are subtle differences between European work habits and US work habits. Example, in Germany and Poland, the peak time is usually Sunday evening. Does anyone have a different peak day than Sunday evening? Anyone has a kind of oddity? For most people, it's Sunday evening, right? Friday, Friday evening. That's interesting. What what type of game is it? Okay, that's interesting because most Friday and Saturday. So the, you're actually mostly US. Very wise words, right? They're spending time with family. The other effect on the US is that US on average goes sooner to bed on Sunday than on Saturday. Why is that? Because they have a longer commute to work on Monday. That's the reason why they have to wake up early. So Sunday evening is not as peak for them as for us. But it gets diluted a little bit because the US is not just one time. It's actually three, right? It's minus nine, minus eight, minus seven, minus six hours. So. Just that you know the kind of subtle differences here if you care about the very specifics. <clears throat> the holidays and vacation habits. Vacation in Germany is like in most of Europe, 
like, you know, hey, we have vacation. There are specific weeks where most people are on a vacation. All of these things should be known because there might be lower DAU than usually. Your CCU is lower. Um, so that's one part. And this is like the federal holidays of the U.S. And they have a very different holiday habit than we have. First, they have less holidays than we do. In Germany, on average, we have 30 workdays holiday. That's like fucking lot. Americans have 10 10, right? So for them, these holidays are a major way to celebrate Thanksgiving and all of these, you know, whatever weekends, bank holiday and so on. Um, so you should take account of these. And most of us, half of our business is done in the US. So you should learn how Americans actually enjoy these. So let's come to weekly patterns. This is a weekly pattern here, uh, which is normal in most of the games I have. Um, this is Sunday, so it comes from the from the peak and then it goes down Monday and then rises again. Um, and this is, you know, the, the this is always a oddity. I can't explain that for now that we have this double dip on the top. Uh, this is like looks like a tooth which is broken. Only this day doesn't have it. Don't ask me why. It's not important, but it's just an interesting observation, right? I don't know how yours uh, look like. And this is another uh, multi-week um, uh, uh, KPI about the average play duration. Um, so this is like 10 minutes per session and suddenly it kind of drops here. Yeah, we had as maintenance on September 5th. This is how dramatic it is. And maintenance means, you know, taking servers down, apply patch, QA, all the tests and stuff. And it's like six hours, seven hours, and then the servers are up again. Yeah, it's not very efficient. Other games do it in an hour, but we are an MMO and it's a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> but even these weekly rhythms you can learn, right? So there are differences from Monday to Friday. In most countries, you do the weekly grocery shopping on Mondays. So there's less money to spend. Usually Monday revenue is wor the, the worst one. But here's the thing. Depending when and where you measure your KPIs, Monday might be okay. So depending which KPI company or service you're using, their cutoff time when they count data to Sunday and to Monday, might actually be overlapping some US time zones. So for us, for example, uh, we're using um, multiple different services. One of the services is actually cutting it off in a way that three hours of West Coast US is counted into the Monday. So our Monday is not as bad as usually it is. That's strange. It's something you should be aware of when your data is being cut off and you know, counted into the various days. Um, on Friday, the traffic rises. You know, some some of you have Friday peak. Uh, most of the games have it Sunday. Um, and meaning that in the middle of the week, we have kind of this slump and then it goes up again. And uh, Monday is usually worst. That means that if you do some fin f offers, special monetization stuff on Mondays, it won't be as effective if you would do it on weekends. Correct? So weekend sales are always better than sales on a Monday. <clears throat> now there's one little but I have here. There are players who play your game only on the weekends because work, work environment, whatever they have to do during the week, they don't have time to play your game. They might log in, do the dailies and then log off again, but the intense game sessions, they don't do that. And they only spend on the weekend. There's also the other way around. There are players who play your game only during the week because they're actually working somewhere else and they're bored in the evening playing your game. And Friday they return home and it's family time and they don't play at all on the weekend. These player types exist. Meaning that if you do something for your players and payers on just one of these sections, you're missing the other player type. That's the reason why I'm a big fan of sales or events which at least last one week because then you're covering most of your player types. Don't forget that not everyone is like us. There are many people out there who have a different lifestyle and a different work style and you have to take that into account if you want to have target nearly everyone. Um, yeah, workers, shift workers, family versus singles behavior and your demographics all vary in terms of pattern and behavior. Remember, they only pay when they play, right? And if they don't play during the week because they don't have the time, you might miss these. So, and then the big one is the monthly rhythms. 
there are some funny things here. Um, uh, this is a monthly um, average duration. Again, we had two maintenance here. And you, you see here the peaks, right? This is all the weekends. Um, so August 13th all the way to there. And it's like this, you know, sine cave, uh, sine curve all over the weekends. And you see that in Eurogame as well. If the oddity is sometimes these curves are lower and sometimes it's kind of rising or, or, or falling. And that depends on the month we talk about. So which is the worst month of the year in terms of revenue, retention, everything? Any hint from your games? For you, it's July? June, July, August. OK. Anyone else? Hmm? September. Oh, wow. Which, which, what's your main territory? Which one? Holland. Poland. So your your most important territory is Poland. Yeah. What's what's in September in Poland? Yeah, there you go. So, so the the so the key information, and I love the differences. I didn't know about Poland. Is that vacation is a killer, and we talk about the summer vacation, like the really big ones, right? There's another thing which is a killer, which is weather, sun. I call it also the hormone factor. I mean, many people go out to find girls or see party or whatever, you know, than to play a game. The weather's there, you know, you go out, you, or the vacation is there. And there's some really crazy examples. I actually, uh, I actually mentioned it on the next slide, so I don't want to uh, have it here. But yes, the middle of the year, in the summer, usually it's the worst. So you have that huge thing over the last three months, the first three months in the year, and then it goes down during the summer, and then it goes up again. Meaning that for you, if you suddenly measure your KPIs and you, you know, you're driving your business and suddenly the KPIs go down in the summer, you, know, you can basically say, yeah, that's one of the factors. Not the decisive factor, but it's one of the factors you have. <clears throat> there are differences by country, like Poland, September. Germany is kind of July until mid-August. Um, France is very different. We, we come to that in a second. Um, that means if you do any events in the game itself, you should take care about that, right? Um, if you do a major event which introduces new features and rare exclusive heroes or ships or whatever you're selling in your game, right? And you only do it in August, you're cutting off a lot of your audience. So kind of try to wiggle around there. Um, yes, we do a summer event in our game, but our summer event we try to span as long as possible in order to cover most countries. <clears throat> so, so here we have it, right? There's something I said, what the fuck France, Finland and go. Um, France goes to vacation, all of France in, in four weeks in August. Like they're all gone. I mean, don't do business in France in this four weeks. The same in Finland. And it seems Poland has a similar problem. I don't know if, if everyone goes there, but you know, it's just, in Germany itself, it's less of a problem because every, every sit, state in, in, within Germany starts the summer vacation on a different week. So it kind of shifts all around. So it's not as dramatic, but there are countries out there where even Italy, where the whole country is just gone. And you can go into the major cities, they're deserted. Not deserted, but you know what I mean, right? So not many people play there. Um, and that's, oops, wrong button. And that, that's the reason why, where's that special button here? No. Um, why December, January is so special. There's like this last three months, first three months. In December, the user acquisition cost is highest. Why is that? It's like so high that most of us cannot afford it during this month. Hmm? E-commerce? That's one reason. Yeah, so e-commerce is basically stealing the users or the prices and writing the prices for that. That's one reason, yeah. Second reason is that whenever you acquire users in December, from our experience, they are the most valuable users you can get in terms of retention monetization. Like they, they beat everyone you recruit during the year by a large margin. Um, there might be reasons for that and there might be research about that, but the, the one reason I think is there is that on Christmas, many people get new phones and the first games they download, they actually spend a lot of time with. 
and they are more invested in these games. That's one of the facts, I think. There might be multi many other ones. Or they just get a voucher card or money on Christmas to spend it on the game and they just kind of you know, continue spending. Um, October to December is very special on iOS. That's an obvious one, right? What happened in, in, in like just a couple of weeks ago, the new iPhone gets announced. It takes a little bit while until it penetrates the market, the delivery all the way until December. So on iOS with the new phones, people want to just show it off. So it's better to download your game and not anyone, someone else's. <clears throat> September to March, this is like the big bump is better than April to August. So you see it here, this is a yearly figure of a game that in January is kind of high and then it slumps down and then it raises again. Um, in, in this game here, it was September, October-ish um, uh, due to the um, main focus on Central Europe. Um, if this would be US, it would be slightly different, I guess. And as I said, you know, the summer distractions is sun, outdoor activity, sports and hormones. Yeah. There's a funny thing, uh, I'm coming to that in a second, is that real life events have a really heavy influence on you as well, depending on your key countries, like Soccer has an influence. People watching soccer or any sport in the US, Super Bowl, forget to bake anything there. Um, but you can actually use that as an event driver. So I'll give you an example. There was a soccer world championship. And we always had problems when Germany played that in Germany there was revenue like, you know, going down the drain. So what we did is that every time Germany scores a goal, we would pay out 50% more premium currency on any pack you buy one hour after the game for every goal they scored, right? And which game nearly killed our business? Yeah, you remember that against Brazil? 7-0, was it? That, that, yeah, we did tons of revenue, but afterwards, you know, they had enough premium currency to go on for, for weeks. But that's one idea where you can actually compensate that, right, if you want to. But nevertheless, major sports event, you should have a, a, you know, an eyeball on. The second thing is, of course, real world events, right? The Ukraine war is hitting over revenue really hard. Because sorry to say, you know, Ukrainians were really goddamn good players and Russia had really good payers as well. So now these two territories are kind of weak. Right? And no one of us are operating games in Russia anymore for obvious reasons. So that, that hit as well. So you have to take care of that. Or any major political or society events. Whenever the Pope dies, you know, that's like four hours where people spend on front of TV. They might not play your game. Or when the new king of the UK is being crowned or marries a beautiful princess or whatever there is, right? Any major event which draws like millions of people in front of the TV. Um, this is one example uh, which I pulled from the internet. Uh, these are major MMORPGs uh, with high revenue. This is uh, monthly revenue, and this is the, the, the old one and the new one. So these are all in the minus. You know, they did 3 million before, and now only 2 million, and this is 1.7 to 1.8, so they actually gained. And this is all August. So they, they have been hit by the holidays. They didn't. So, you know, we can see why that is, but nevertheless, there is uh, a monthly impact. By the way, the September revenue was okay again. Yeah, so, and we, we talk about here major titles. Yeah. So why didn't I show retention curves yet? Um, I just want to say, you know, these are kind of CCU or DAU curves or whatever you're talking about. This is like the major behavior pattern of users. Retention is for me the, I hate retention for various reasons. Yeah, you're laughing, but retention sucks. For everyone, who has ever raised their retention by more than 10%? You're cheating. It, it just Italy? Oh, okay. So it's fucking hard. So here's the thing. Retention is the hardest to fix. It is. I can fix conversion for you. I can fix ARPU, RPPU, all of that. If you hire me, I can fix for you. But retention is like very difficult. So... There has been a scientific research I was part of. How can we change retention? It was by the data of three games. One of the games actually was running for over 10 years. So there was terabytes of data to actually analyze that. And what we found out is that the retention is rooted in the DNA of your game. 
no daily lock-in bonus will fix your retention. No daily whatever will fix your retention, right? It will just shift it around. This is all it does. So what you have to do in order to fix retention is you have to change your game. Because retention ultimately, ultimately means is your game good enough or not to continue playing. That's the only thing retention means. What, whatever menu systems, mechanics you put into the game, basically just shifts retention. And you can prove that, right? If your up to day seven retention was like that and you improved that, right? Measure day 14, it's unchanged. Because in the end, they just quit later. Because it's the game they don't like. It's not your menus or your retention stuff. Right, and it's not a tutorial either. Um, so th this is how I try to explain it. Right, if your retention is bad, your game sucks. So if you want to raise retention, make your game better. That's the reason why retention curves are very hard to analyze and get a rhythm inside. Too many factors, specifically early early retention. I could make a talk about mid and end game retention. That's a very different thing because this is only engaged users. You're over the point where they like or not like the game. They like the game if they're in the mid-game. Um, but nevertheless, this is the reason why retention shouldn't be part of rhythms. <clears throat> so now let's get to the interesting part. Yeah, you like that slide, right? Just making a photo. But it's in rock and roll. Um, this is a but. I found this on the internet. I found this really funny. Um, this is a CCU of a game. It really happened, and it got us completely puzzled by the time we saw it the first, the first time. So what the heck is going on? Anyone has a guess? Hiccup, server down, anything? I give you one hint, okay? Anyone? Pardon? There you go. Football match. 45 minutes first half, they log in for 15 minutes to collect the goodies, 45 minutes second half. This is really what happened. So the whole ass form is just because a major soccer event is happening. And th that of course affects only countries where soccer is big, right? America doesn't care, they, but they have American football, different Super Bowl, you know, different audience. But nevertheless, that kind of stumped us. So that's what we then used to actually make events during soccer championships, which affect or so kind of support the fans. Hey, we scored a goal, so we get a bonus, stuff like this. And at some point, the final form of this was that the, the goal and bonuses was in every single country for their team. So in Poland for the Polish team, in Germany for the German team, France for the French team, etc. You know, and we did the whole thing and they loved it. You know, everybody loved it, specifically the goodies. Um, because we wanted to, uh, instead of making a problem out of this, we actually made it a positive thing for the player. So, um, next topic from the butt, we come to the tits. It's not really, but it kind of fits, right? So what, what is happening here? Um, <laughs> so we're talking about game content updates. Game content updates usually do this. A lot of old users coming back looking, hey, you know, is the game better now? New users love it. Uh, usually you get more attention because you made a game update. Apple might actually put you on the, you know, new update list, event featuring and so on. So there's always like this. And then after the game update, it actually slows down again. So, and that's the frustrating part, right? You hope that this one is higher than the old one, but it might not happen. Um, this is a chart which is really hard to find, but it's actually easy once you know where. That's the reason why I have the URL down here. This is from Angry Birds 2, their revenue by their up upgrade philosophy. So you see that Angry Birds 2 had a kind of problematic start. Then they um, uh, shipped um, a an update, which kind of worked, but kind of load a little bit. Then they shipped hats, which raised the whole thing, the base value, then they shipped the kickback panic, raised the base as well, and then they shipped the Tower of Fortune, and that raised the whole level to 25 million a month. That's kind of cool. That's, that's how important updates are. And you see here this, you know, the up and downs, the rhythms, where you can identify that. That's basically confirming how most free-to-play games work now. But it also shows how important your update philosophy is. I have seen many companies who launch a game which is working okay, and all they do is shipping the same stuff in the game. Like, oh, we have a game about trains. Yeah, let's make more trains. That's it. 
They don't care about expansions, about new game modes, mechanics, you know, basically expand the universe vertically and horizontally. But you should do that because this is how you prolong the game. Otherwise, your game will die in the long term because any more of the same content has diminishing returns, meaning that it will be less and less effective over time. Example, you have 12 trains in your, in your game. Releasing a new train is a, a good thing to do. But imagine you have 100 trains and you put a new train in it. No one cares. So at some point, you're running to this wall. So you have to ship new content. Um, this is the, the same thing only in, in a different format uh, that's coming from, from Zenza Tower. So it started quite rocky, and they basically said they analyzed the game, including the competition, they corrected it, and the expanding was the key to success. It was not more of the same, it was actually expanding it. So the, the, the key thing they also said in that, um, in that call, it was investor call, I think, is that new game modes addressing new player types and continued service. This is something you should do. If your game is working well, don't sit still and just do more of the same. It works to an extent, but you should think about attracting new player and new player types. Give them more of something to do, that they're not bored with the routine cycle of your game, that they have a distraction and play something else. If they're bored with your game and find something else in your game to do, it's good. Otherwise, they will find it in another game and they're gone. That's as simple as it is. <clears throat> this is a slide I actually adapted from Darius. Uh, he did this talk last year, very interesting one. You should actually, it's on YouTube now, you should uh, actually take a look. This is the normal um, a cycle of, you know, the, the online games like Rockabilly, Novelty, then there's progression, vectors of mastery, then there are return triggers and nudges, and then it's social and life operations. And all of them go down over time, and you, and you hope that this base is enough to actually make your game survive. Every single major update you do will start that cycle again. That's how important it is. And then it goes up, 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 up until you're at a point where you can no longer grow. That's the key to, um, to maximize the lifetime of players. And you can see this on this, my favorite example. It's a game Tibia. It's one of the oldest MMORPGs we have on Earth, which is still running. Over 20 years. It was launched in 1997. And they still make major updates every three months until this day. Now you're interested, yeah, this game looks old and is pixely and so on. You know, how much money does it do? Well, the revenue of this game grew year by year since the last 10 years. And it's feeding 90 people, 90 developers on this game. And it's, and it's doing more and more money every year for 20 years. Now, I would love to have a title like that. That should be the goal of all of us, right? To have a title which just sustains your company forever. So remember, it's the expansion which runs your longevity. It's not, hey, let's make 10 more hats, 10 more weapons, 10 more whatever. Yeah, reminder, successful free-to-play games lift decades and still push expansions. You see, in our charts, top 10, we still have games which launched 10 years ago, right? Clash Royale, Clash of Clans, and all of that. You know, we would love to have these games. Learn from that. They're still expanding the games like crazy. Um, in terms of rock and roll, um, we, we often see this, right? This is like this big, spiky data. Um, and what we did here is that we did weekend events. So starting on Friday morning, our Friday morning, so the US who wakes up Friday, the event is already running, and it stops our Monday morning, meaning that midnight Sunday in the US West Coast. Um, and that rose retention and activity of the players and session times. Then we attached monetization to it, and it spiked revenue over the weekends, which is normal for everyone who designs weekend events, but it shifted revenue from during the week to the weekends. So it rose the overall value, but on the other hand, it shifted some of that to the weekend. This is natural because if you know that there's monetization stuff going on in your pair, you don't pay during the week. You actually wait to the weekend because there might be special offers. So that's what's actually happening here. This is like the weekends. Um, <clears throat> and this is just fun stuff here. No, ignore that. I just wanted to find some interesting graph. It's about spatial and temporal variation of the ambient noise environment of the Sikkim Himalaya. 
that we set you now. That's good, because the events I told you about are the weekend events, which are kind of these short little bursts you do, right? But the trick for proper long-term retention and proper long-term monetization is to, long, to launch longer events. One, two, maybe even four week long events. And there are certain rules to it, how you should run it. And there are plenty of examples out there. You should look at the MMO RPGs, how they do it, and not at the short temper PvP games, um, because you can attach battle passes to it. You can uh, sales offers, a lot of things there. And usually during events, like you see here, you have a spike in everything. These are two maintenances in the middle, but you see this is the baseline before the event and it actually spiked all over the place. And then after the event, um, the baseline is back. There is an after event hole because people kind of overspend during the event, meaning that after the event closes down, they're kind of more, oh, I spent 50 bucks last week, so let's, you know, time out a little bit. Attempts to fix that after whole event are fru fru fruitile, don't do it, just let the whole run. Um, but what happens is that there are certain KPIs which are permanently higher after the event than before. For example, conversion rate. Each event we run, a longer one, raises the conversion rate. And that's worth a lot because we know that payers have the best retention. So try to learn how long events work. Like one day events is fine, but it's not sexy enough. It makes money, it makes business happy, but you want to have long-term effects, right? So try to design a one-week event which isn't boring, that people can work, can get free stuff, and so on. Um, the thing is that I love to do ba uh, games with a heavy, deep economy inside because economies are so easy to monetize and they're you know just very sexy in overall to run free-to-play games with. And when you do an event game which heavily relies on that economy, the economy needs some time to stabilize again. You know, it's basically going up and down and crazy during the event and after the event closes down, it kind of needs time to kind of calm down to normal levels again. And then you can say, hey, let's do the next event, and it goes crazy again. <clears throat> if you do uh, events back by back, if you do too many events, your events become normal gameplay, right? And with normal gameplay, they're not special anymore, meaning that they will stop monetizing as well as this one does. So there's a certain frequency, right? One event minimum, I think I have it here. Yeah, in the next slide, the learnings about events come in the next slide. So some key learnings here. You should look at your main curves every day. Don't overinterpret what you see. Just look that you learn the patterns so that you know when there's something abnormal, something strange happening, and then you can dig in and research. Um, don't trust averages. Averages is like the worst you can have, right? This is my most prominent example. You know, it's called the, uh, the Enscombi Quartet. These are entirely four different curves and patterns you see. The averages in every aspect of these four graphs are identical. That's bad, right? If you want to learn patterns, averages like really suck. So try to, you know, learn what average and median is, the difference between these, learn to read the patterns. You should not overinterpret singular events. So there was a day when the revenue suddenly was like half of, of what it was used to be. It was a Tuesday. We had no idea what happened. Was our payment system offline? No. Was the server offline? No. What the heck happened, right? Well, we don't know. So it's just one day. And the next day it was normal again, right? So don't overinterpret a singular day. Don't kind of overreact when one day something's happened. You, you've been there, done that, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. That makes your life stressy, right? Like you. <gasps> 20% less revenue today, let's fix it. No, 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 calm down, calm down. Let's see how it develops tomorrow, okay? Um, the other thing what I learned is that there's never a single cause. When something goes wrong, there's never a single cause. There's always three. Yes, if server goes down, fine. That's like not what I mean. I mean is that suddenly your conversion rate goes down. Like slightly, steadily it goes down. It's not one single effect where you can pinpoint this is it, I fix it, and then it's done. Because if that would be the case, you could Google the problem. You can't. So usually there are two or three factors influencing that behavior. So that's why I think that daily KPIs are bad for you. They're good to learn patterns, but following daily KPIs and making your business plan from daily KPIs is not a good thing. Most online games have a weekly rhythm. 
So at least use a week, not a day. Learn the day stuffed for day-to-day -day operations, stability and all of that. But, you know, uh, to make business decisions out of daily KPIs is not a good idea. Because your business decisions in August will be completely different than in January, right? So why base it there? Don't. So you should investigate in short, medium, and long-term behavior of data. And in order to do that, you need time. You cannot chip a new feature and next day you see if it works or not. No, you have to collect at least a week data in order to make a really good decision on it. So take your time, calm down, don't panic. I've seen this in live operations that, you know, the live operation manager, what, zip, 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 running around. Oh, we have a problem, we have a problem. I'm like, what is it today? Right, calm down, here, have a coffee. Yeah, so go there. Next thing, maintenances. Maintenance is a major update. Never do Mondays. Why never Mondays? Because Mondays, we go to the office. We are not active yet over there. You will make newbie mistakes. Something will go wrong. And some service providers on US time zone aren't even in the office yet. So Monday, not a good day. Thursday and Fridays. If you make major updates on a Thursday and it's broken, you have to hotfix. Your programmers will spend all day and Friday in the office and fix it until Saturday. You want to have that, that your team has to be on the weekend in the office because only you updated Thursdays? No. Fridays, even worse. So update and maintenance, only Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Only. If you're not ready for Wednesday and you say, yeah, everything will go good, we, we, we will make it on Thursday. Don't. Just shift it a week. Really. Your weekends will kill the motivation of your team. And that's tough. So don't try to do that. And you should maintain when your major territory is asleep. So for us, it's in the morning because the US is sleeping. And we know when they wake up. Until then, we have to be done, right? So if Europe is your key, it's hard. You don't want to actually update in during the night or early morning, right? When I was consulting Ubisoft, we had the comfort that they had offices all around the world. So actually the US was doing our updates because our major territories were Germany and Poland. So we woke up in the morning and the update was done. We say, yippee. So that's cool, but not many people can afford actually that. Um, in terms of updates and, and a month, why? Why don't you update in the beginning of the month? Like 1st of October. Why don't you update on 1st of October? Hmm? Salary. Salary is being paid depending on country, end of the month or beginning of the month. This is when people have most money and spend most money on games. You don't update that. It should block like the last week and the first week of a month. You kind of should be cautious to update a game there. Be careful. There's another point, depending by country, mid of the month, usually social payment is coming in many countries, like unemployment payments. I don't know how it's in Poland, but you know, in Germany, for example, unemployment payment and social payments are coming mid of the month. These players are very loyal, very good, a good mass of free to play cameras. Low players, low payers, but very loyal to your game. So if you do something there, you know, you will hurt that revenue coming in. So mid-month is a problematic as well. Try to shift around these, these dates depending on your key territory, right? Um, so you should prevent to update or maintain your game in the peak weeks or months. So if December and January are so important, you know, ship your damn update in November and not in December and January where you can ruin everything. Oh, we broke the game. I'm sorry. We need three days to fix it. Mm, that's not good. So... You know, prepare that. Um, update regularly, this is kind of my rule. The average lifetime of users in your game, like the whole lifetime, should at least see one main event or one update. That's the pattern you should have. Because when he sees that, he knows that you care about the game. He sees something new, he sees the service you're providing him. That's a very important retention method. Right? If you have longer events being planned, this is the stuff I mentioned before, um, we try to make one major event per lifetime of the player so that everybody sees, oh, there's something cool. 
I want to wait for the next one, you know, and we usually shift the type of events every time. Um, if there are longer events than two weeks, we try to split them into multiple parts. There are many examples about that, how you do that. Um, and because three week event is too long, you will have a huge bump in the middle because people are just tired of it and they just wait till the end to grant other rewards. So try to split them. This this month we will run two events back by back. We have the one year anniversary in Homeworld, which we run, and then directly after that the Halloween event, which is very important, right? And they run back to back. So theoretically, it's kind of a two week event, but it's split in the middle. So the peak of the first event is on day seven, right? And the next one is then on the next one, and that kind of reduces the bump and the exhaustion of that event. Um, we start events on Fridays to basically get the, the, the weekend into the event and end it, including the next weekend. We don't do seven-day events. We do seven-day plus weekend event so that both weekends are in the same event. That's a learning. You know, seven days is such an artificial thing. Don't believe whatever. One week is seven days. That's the reason why it has to be seven days. No, it doesn't. So an event is very efficient running from weekend to weekend because there are two peaks inside. Um, we end Monday noon, our time, that's when America goes to bed, event is down, but if we have an event shop, like in the event you can earn event currency, right, to whatever you envision, and with that I can buy exclusive stuff in the event, this is how the monetization works. And the shop is actually open one or two days longer than the event, why? Because users are stupid. They're what do you mean the event is over? But I've, I wanted to buy that thing. Well, yeah, exactly for these users. And believe me, there are many of them, right? And to save support from, I oh, had to still buy that thing, just leave the shop open for one, two days, and you're fine, and people are happy. Um, the event toolbox, how we call it, like the ways how we actually manage the events, is growing over time, the more different events we put in, meaning that at some point we have enough tools to construct events out of that without any major programming. This is at least the goal we have. And with Homeworld, we are close. With our second game, None of Ages, we are just creating it. Um, so that means because it's growing over time, don't overdo events at first. Focus on the main game first before you run your first event. There's like this notion, and I had many clients doing this, like, oh, we launched now, we have, we have to run an event, Easter is coming. And I said, well, your game isn't even ready yet fully, so calm down, right? You don't need it, 10 minute warning. Um, try to prevent stacked events. What I mean is that if you're running an event, a major event, and run another event in between, that's dangerous because if there are rebates, offers and stuff in there, they might multiply and have secondary effects you don't want to have. Be careful with stacked events. You have to know what you're doing in order to be able to stack events. The, the other thing is, which is a mistake specifically in December, don't do Christmas events. Don't. Call them winter events. Because Christmas assumes everyone is Christian. And this is completely ignoring half of your player base. They don't like Christians. They're not Christian. They might be Buddhists. They might be Muslims. They might, you, know, you don't care what religion they have. At least they should play your game. So don't run a Christian-only event because they will boycott it. Don't do it. Call it winter event. That's the reason why you don't have an Easter event. Eastern is a Christian thing. So have an event around collecting eggs, funny rabbits. Don't call it Easter. Okay, that's very important because your audience is worldwide. So you should basically embrace all religions and all people. Um, so the must-have events, at least in my um, uh, world, is Halloween, Black Friday, winter, summer, Thanksgiving, and Chinese New Year, if Asia is part of you. Thanksgiving, important for the US, is like the biggest thingy. Uh, tied to Black Friday, you know, everybody is selling on Black Friday, nearly everyone, so Americans expect sales in your game. They complain if there are none. So we didn't have Black Friday last year. We had angry email from pairs. Why didn't you run a Black Friday sale? I'm stuck paying for this game. And they're like, uh, I'm sorry. Right? So just a reminder. Um, so in terms of sales and offers, I do quick. You know, you should do it at the very beginning or very end of the month or on weekends. For smaller wallets, like three, four, five euro sales, do mid-month if possible. Um, we always introduce new monetization offers with major expansions so that people 
don't see how yeah, they're just after our money because all the new stuff in this update is only for payers. Try to prevent that. Put the new monetization stuff into normal gameplay updates. Um, yeah, and this is my biggest tip. If you're running out of stuff to sell, ask your payers what they would pay for. They will tell you. And then you implement it, and they will pay for it. It works, really. We did that last time. Yeah, I would love to pay for this. And we were like, oh, we don't have that in the game yet. We did, and it's selling like crazy. Right? Ask your people. They're your fans. So, final words, number one. There will be a second one. Is free-to-play online games are hobbies, not just games. Very important. So you have to incorporate real life of your players into your game, right? Rely on that. Your data and player feedback, feedback will tell you when, what is best to update, sell, maintain, and expand your game. If you don't know what to do in your game, ask your players. It's such an open secret. It's so easy, but not that many players do it. Uh, operators. Care about your players, I will thank you in retention and revenue. So, one last thing, because everybody sees that happening. It's a major rhythm, which is not part of this, because it's not only tied to free-to-play, it's the rhythm of our industry. You heard about all the companies closing, selling, laying off people, all of that, right? And we're all worried what the heck is going wrong. Investment is all-time low. All of that is happening. But I'm in this industry since 37 years. I have seen this happening several times now. It's normal. It's part of a cycle. Our industry had a five-year cycle in the old times, which now shifted more or less to a six to seven-year cycle. This happens every six to seven years. Really, it does. So it's normal, and it will be better in a year or a year and a half. Right? It's like this normal stuff goes down, and then suddenly you know, the sun shines again. And usually, something new comes with that. Last time, it was mobile. If you know these rhythms and you have noted down the dates, you can predict when it happens. And that can save the ass of your business. So if you're CEO of your company or your leader, your CEO, you should know these rhythms of the industry so that you can save and set money to a side and be a little bit more conservative during these transition years. That's how they're called. Because everybody of the old fart industries, they know they already turned conservative a year ago. So this is just the last major rhythm I wanted to put on here. Thank you. So I think we have time for one or two questions, that's it. Yeah. All the way to the back. You, you, you had a talk right before me, right? So let's take him first, OK? There was one here? I didn't see it. So you first. That's OK. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, and I really, really like the talk. Uh, I just have one one point to add to the thing about football. So actually, the electric grid in the UK has to turn on peaker plants during the matches when there is the football break because the the people who are watching football go to make tea during the break. So there's like a million extra kettles. So I think that's 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 kind of uh, going with that. But I have a question regarding the uh, sales that you do, and it, I, I don't think you touched up upon that, but that's regarding the programmatic ads, sorry, programmatic uh, sales, so that you like adapt uh, the, um, the, the sales that you do based on user uh, inputs and like using machine learnings. Because for example, we do it uh, kind of randomly so that the sales are uh, the same for all the players instead of kind of tailoring it down to the player. So like they can say, oh, today there's a Black Friday sale for $1, you get 50 bucks yeah. worth, instead of like everyone gets something different. So one of so, your points. No, if everybody gets something different, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it right. Everybody in your community, player community, should be handled the same. So if one player gets a sale, everybody should have it. And there are two rules. If you do a sale, do it global to everyone. And if it's progression-based, like, hey, you reach level 10, this is a sale I'm going to you. Everybody who reaches level 10 actually gets that sale. The different sales tactics you can apply by your data to every single user is the one thing which killed Zynga. Zynga killed all of their games with that tactic because their sales were entirely different for every user. And they talk about each other and they don't think this is funny. Now, the word sales in my word, you know, I don't like sales because sales devalues your stuff you're selling. 
it destroys the baseline value of everything. So with sales, what I mean is that, for example, in our weekend sales, what we're doing, we're selling stuff which is only available during that weekend. And if you cannot get it there, you have to wait for four weeks until that same event actually is there. So reducing the value of anything, right, is something I heavily fight against because it has been proven to diminishing to diminish the value of long-term payers. But that's a completely different topic. But you can Google on YouTube my old talks where I'm actually touching this. But yeah, okay. thank there you. Was another question here, all the way front. Faster. We only have two minutes. <laughs> stronger uh, okay uh, thank you for the talk uh, there are a lot of extremely good points we use also in our game um, I wanted to elaborate on the events because you mostly talked about them as a monetization uh, tool for making money uh, do you ever use uh, events to for different tasks for example in our game we often do events to return players for the back to school, yes, which is no, uh, September, right. to have a monetization even yeah. later in the winter, okay, he, and he has, also stabilize the economy. Monetization is just part of the events we are running. So generally, the whole event is about retention, and you can earn tons of goodies without paying at all. But payers have basically a small added value they can invest into the event to actually do that. So monetization is about 30% of the event. And yes, we do events without monetization at all. We, we call them retention events. Um, so it's always good to run them, you know, vice versa, like retention first and monetization. But most of the longer events have monetization attached, but you don't need to monetize in order to get cool stuff in the event. You just get more cool stuff if you pay. That's yeah. how uh, we're doing sounds it. Sounds great. And I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry for my weakness, but I really want to uh, uh, say that uh, you said to not use averages and used average <laughs> in your presentation when you talked yes. about the LT, uh, which is very tricky because uh, yes. when you have long lasting game, your average LT will be uh, like not representative at all because yes. your old user's LT may be yes. years, years, and yes. new user's LT yeah. may be. A lot less. Uh, I'm I'm sorry that and, I simplified uh, it here, but lifetime itself is a whole talk by itself because it's so complicated to calculate um, and how to actually view lifetime. So what we usually do, we cohort lifetime into specific segments and groups and God knows what, and then we measure how on median and average this lifetime actually is. And then we take that. You know, yeah, average uh, is fine for rough like that, right? Then average is fine. But if you want to precise n nail down how many days exactly do users stay in your game, you know, you have to dig deeper. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. I was just like <laughs> yeah. picking at you a little bit because it was kind yeah. of funny. No, that's uh, okay. That's a good one. Yeah. Meh, he caught me. <laughs> okay, one more question, then we're done. We don't have time. Oh. No more questions. Thanks.